Truck it! Welcome back to What the Truck. We had a few days off. I uh, I took a nice little little trip. Had a logistics tie-in to it. The um, the winner, the champion, the current reigning champion of the Freight Tech 25, my buddy Jet McCandless. He lives down in a place called Jackson Hole. I was talking to him, uh, geez, about a month or two ago, and I said, uh, hey Jet, where are you sitting? Because I could see in the back and it looked beautiful. And he goes, hey, I spend my summers down in Jackson Hole. You should come out sometime. And next thing I know, my wife and I are flying down there. Let's take a look at what happened in Jackson Hole. This is Chattanooga right here. You get out there, you got to go through DFW for us. But when you step out the plane, you see those Grand Tetons right there. They got the, um, what are those, antlers? They got the antler walkways you go through. You get off to right in nature. There was a guy holding a raptor right at baggage claim. They got the bears with the mustache. There's a silver dollar bar right there. They've got 4,200. 1921 silver dollars because I guess that's when the town like got recognized or in incorporated. I wasn't exactly clear. Obviously, you got to get a cowboy hat when you're in there. Cowboy hat's very normalized. A lot of driving. That's Jet's uh, Silverado. Thank you for letting me borrow that jet. Animals all over the place. And here's the nice thing about working with someone in logistics when you're doing a trip and they help you plan it. He helped us set up everything over here. Like, I didn't know anything that goes on in Jackson Hole. He set us up to go to dinner over here, riding these gondolas up to the top of the mountains. I gotta tell you though, it gets chilly out there. It's a bit like a desert. So like on the ground, it's 74 degrees, but you get up to the top of that mountain, it's about like 42. And when you're looking out over that view, you can see how people can get in trouble really quick. Some moose over there, apparently they're shedding. They're, uh, they shed the velvet. Oh, those are the molten cabins. Those things are fantastic. But the moose are shedding the velvet off their, uh, their horns because in about a month, it'll be mating season. But before they do that, they got to beat each other up. All the bulls beat the crap out of each other, and then they can find their mates. But this is what I was really looking for was a bear. And we're like inches from this thing. It's right there in that huckleberry tree. And we're going to get a really good look at it when we come right around this bend. We have this awesome guy named Nick. Nick, thank you so much. He was like eagle eye he gets by there he is there's that bear right there little brown bear and i think we might even get a better look there we go national parks i don't know what people are doing on the toilet something there that is uh that was either the snake or the jenny river i'm not exactly sure that's our guide nick he's bringing us around you can see everything's like so picturesque like right it looks like we're like photoshopped into this stuff how did an idiot like me get down to a place like that you see those bears you see how that that bear was in the huckleberry tree right near you they have these bear boxes all over the place because you have to look out for them. There's a moose right there with uh, her baby, and apparently they're some of the most dangerous out there. We had that that water protecting us from them. But if you go near a moose with uh, I, what are they, their fawn or their calf or whatever, they will come at you. That right there, million dollar cowboy bar. Do not eat there. It's nice in there. The the seats are like are uh, are saddles, which are kind of comfortable. Um, but the food's not good. Go to Silver Dollar Bar for the food instead. Up there is flying around looking for desperados. We're gonna take on a. Uh, certain organizations. This is the Million Dollar Bar. It's really cool, and they have dancing. Clint Black was playing. Um, but again, just eat beforehand. Eat anywhere beforehand. The other big thing there, they're super into wildlife. So they got all these heads and everything. Uh, we had some e-bikes. We went over to an elk preserve. Uh, there's my buddy Jet. He took us out to dinner at this place called the Snake River Grill. Had some delicious duck over there. In Wyoming, you can ride in the back of a pickup truck, so Jet and I did just that. Uh, that was Marianne. She was at a, uh, a wedding. There was a doppelganger of me over there. This is the Snake River. We went rafting down that with this great guy named Zach. He's been out there for about nine years. A lot of people transplant out there, and they're either like super, super rich, or you're like really, really into nature, and you become a guide, and you bring everyone around. These are the hot springs over there. And the cool thing, like, the one thing about these rapids is the calm parts are the most dangerous ones. They have these boils underwater, which are like lake riptides. And if you get in them, they'll suck you right underwater. Uh, he said, like, every 4th of July for the past few years, they've lost someone over there. That's for the dog at home. Got to get everybody gifts when you go on a trip like this. And I got to go to my first rodeo. A little horse I met. That horse's name is Lollipop, that little pony. There's my wife. We got to celebrate our 10 year at that. And of course, you know, you got to go dress for the occasion. These guys right here, though, that has to be like one of the most painful professions you can be in. Just look at how these guys get like jerked around and slammed into the ground. And they do this three nights a week at this. Like this guy, he doesn't even get knocked off. But like, imagine your back.
That's like trying to hang on to the trucking industry the past couple years. And that's the that's when uh, an account executive finds out there's a shipper at the conference. No, what they had there was an uh, elementary school. Though the elementary school come out and they do these like sheep chases. But what's wild is a lot of these like rodeo people. They have them riding bulls. Like there was kids on bulls at like 12 years old, just totally getting wrecked and slammed onto the ground. I highly recommend going down there. Uh, have you ever seen Rocky IV? It stood in. It was the stand-in for Siberia, the mountains that Rocky's training at, and that Milton cabin. They didn't use the actual Milton cabin. The set designers made their own. Uh, Shane, the Western, was made there before they all went over to Italy. And uh, The Last of Us of all movies, or all TV shows and video games, that was also... Jackson is like that community everyone goes to stay away from the disease. Anyways, thank you so much to the McCandless family, Sherry, Nick, and the Project 44 team who helped. Um, my wife and I set up a really, really awesome 10th anniversary. You guys are the best. I mean, honestly. I'm just I'm humbled and blown away. Uh, happy... Happy National Truck Driver Appreciation Week to all of you out there uh, who are drivers or who are celebrating, who are appreciators. I have Super Trucker out there looking for the best and worst of Truck Driver Appreciation Week. We're going to talk about it on Wednesday. I know it's, some people love it, some people it's controversial. So tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like. You can email me, tduner at freightwaves.com, or find me on social media, Timothy Dooner on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. PSA, before we get to some guests here, Nicholas keeps setting on fire, and now they want their customers to return them. The company experienced its fourth battery fire since June last Friday. Now Alan Adler's saying Nicola uh, is asking everyone to bring those out. The first responders, they doused a battery fire out on Monday, and then again on Friday. No injuries reported in either incident, but obviously this is really concerning. If you remember in June, Nicola tried to deflect on this one. They said, ah, oh, you know what? It must have been arson. It must have been some Nicola hater. No, it's a coolant link in the batteries. There's some issues. Uh, as Alan said before, there could be some issues with what they were doing with Romeo uh, batteries. And I hear Romeo's liquidating their stuff. So I'm not sure about Nikola right now. I haven't been sure about Nikola for a long time. Oh, and according to the AP, one thing you'd just be mindful of, keep a watch on this. There could be a 146,000 U.S. auto worker strike. Show them that headline, please. Are set to strike this Wednesday, according to General Motors, I think they have until 11.59 p.m. Eastern time. I'm sorry, 11.59 p.m. Eastern time Thursday. This is when their union contract expires. Yellow didn't work out in the bargaining. UPS did. This group has to come together on it. We hope that they do. This would not be good for uh, car inventories or anything. We'll have more on this on Wednesday and through the week, but I just want you all to be mindful of that as well. On today's show, we are kicking off National Truck Driver Appreciation Week with Ricky Shark and Ashley Milicek from the Associate to Driver Program at Walmart and Sam's Club. This thing is so cool. We'll find out how more than 70 Walmart and Sam's Club associates are taking on new roles as regional truck drivers for Walmart's private fleet. Many of them are earning over six figures, and they're inspiring associates that there's even more career pathways they can go to. What an amazing story for Truck Driver Appreciation Week. We got William Doyle, the CEO of Dredging Contractors of America. Last time we talked to him, he was at the Port of Baltimore. Now he's dredging all the ports. He's dredging all the waterways. He's dredging all the like the wind farms and all that kind of stuff. We're going to find out how dredging works. It looks really, really cool. Uh, there's a new ruling out too. Drivers out there, carriers, you need to know about saliva-based DOT drug testing went into effect June 1st, but it hasn't really been deployed. We're going to find out why from Kathy Clark. She's from JJ Keller. Plus, we'll have some Flexport Fallout, semi truck, golf carts, an amazing rescue, and much more. But first, I got to tip the band. However, I have last month's read on here, so bear with me with a second, and I will open up an older sheet that has this month's read. I apologize for that. Not that I don't know. Lee, you talk about Truck Driver Appreciation Week. Our sponsor this month is Uber for Business, and what Uber for Business does that is really cool is your dispatcher, once your truck is parked, right? Truck parking, one parking spot for every 11 trucks out there. Once your truck's parked, your dispatch can get an Uber for you. You can go to the grocery store. You can go eat somewhere other than McDonald's or whatever they have at the rest stop. It's totally awesome. Awesome. No ride, no app, no problem. With Uber Central and Uber for Business, you can help your drivers get where they need to go after dropping off the after dropping off the truck. Schedule rides, control costs, and access 24/7 support and easy to use dashboard. Just look up Uber for Business. All right, let's get to our first guest today. It's William Doyle. He's the CEO of our, over at Dredging Contractors of America. You look great, man. I like you in your new role. I uh, really, really enjoy the. Uh this operation sides of what we can do for the ports by way of dredging and marine construction. So when, when did you, when did you switch over? Cause last time we talked to you, which maybe wasn't even six months ago, you were over at the port of Baltimore. 
Yeah, so um, I did three years at the Port of Baltimore, um, and it was it was basically a three year sprint. I mean, I got there in July of 2020 during the height of the pandemic, so uh, we had so much going on there. Uh, and then, you know, three years um, came in. We've had a change of administrations, and um, I did really want to get back into the private sector. So I figured this would be a great place to uh, to land and work for the um, you know in, into a good period of time. Well, hey, being a Boston guy, you and I, we know, uh, and especially Boston guy and a cowboy hat, too. really fits with the accent. Uh, <laughs> but being a Boston guy, we all know about, like, Conley, right? There's dredging always happening in Boston Harbor. That's It's built on landfill. It's sediment. It comes in. But before we get into, like, how dredging works and all that, what is Dredging Contractors of America? So Dredging Contractors of America is an association of dredges. So um, when you look at the United States dredging industry, uh, it's very competitive. Uh, there are over 25 companies that dredge in the United States of America. Uh, a lot of work is done through contracting with the Army Corps of Engineers or privately through ports or even counties, uh, state and municipal counties. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's not only dredging for commerce. It's also you take that material more and more often now, what you es- excavate from the ocean floor, you will reuse for marshes. Um, if you have to do plasting, you take the rock out, you can build fish reefs, um, coastal restoration, island building. So we've seen over the past 10, 15 years, more and more of the dredging material that we take out, we reuse, we recycle for bumpers along the coastline as opposed to just taking out the sea and dumping it. So that's, that's where we are, and the companies all compete for this work. Um, and I can say right now that in the history of dredging, right now there are more dredges over the past three years built and being built in the United States than ever before. So you have shipyards that are building dredges left and right um, across the country. Okay, so how does this all work? Because it sounds like there's a lot that goes into it. Not only do you have to figure out the project, find the project, blast it, dredge it, get it up, and then figure out where you're going to put all this stuff. Take us into your world. How does a dredging project work? So what will happen is, I mean, if you take, for instance, you know, the cross-section between commerce and dredging, okay? And what you're seeing right now is a diversification of cargo um, that's moving to the East Coast, okay? So you're seeing ports basically diversify. Uh, And a lot of that had to do with the expansion of the Panama Canal in 2016. Now the Panama Canal opened in 2016. That allowed three times the size of the ships to come from Asia through the Panama Canal and into the Gulf and East Coast of the United States. So the infrastructure was for a hundred years have been based on a 4,500 TEU vessel coming to the Eastern Gulf Coast. Now you've got three times the size. So you have to right size the Eastern Gulf Coast. And what the Eastern Gulf Coast are doing now is they are dredging their ports deeper to 50 feet all over the Gulf and East Coast from Maine, New York, all the way down through, you know, the South Atlantic, through Florida and into the Gulf Coast, Alabama and up into Houston, Galveston. So you're seeing that. And where there are federal channels, it's the Army Corps of Engineers that puts out that work. So they'll put the work out, uh, usually funded through uh, water resources development uh, authorization bill and then appropriated by Congress on these channels that at some point were 35 feet, 40 feet, now we need 50, 55 feet of water depth. Those contracts are put out by the Army Corps of Engineers and then the private sector bids on them and then they come in and um, you know dredge those projects and get the material so we can have those larger ships. Another interesting point there is that when the Panama Canal was expanded, when the lead up to the expansion of that Panama Canal, if you remember, we didn't have shale gas going out of the United States. As a matter of fact, we didn't have any natural gas or oil that was allowed to be exported out of the United States. And in the design of that Panama Canal, they never imagined in a million years back in 2007 that the U.S. would have exports of liquefied natural gas. Because if you look at the two markets, one of the largest markets in the world for natural gas, it's South Korea and Japan. 
So now you have the ports that are deeper along the Gulf Coast that can load these LNG tankers, get through the Panama Canal into um, South Korea and uh, Japan faster and more economically due to the canal and the dredging that we have going on in the Gulf Coast. So, so much of that is is fascinating. I, the point about the bigger ships, too, like dredging, for example, like looking at the port of Boston, they had to do it. You know, yeah. New York feeds yeah. Boston and bigger yeah. vessels are coming to New York. The smaller ones are getting taken out of service. So in order to even stay viable, yeah. they had to do these massive dredging projects. Some of them can take a long time, like Port of Boston, for uh, example. What, what are some of the most challenging ones that, that you've had to deal with or that you know about? Well, the Port of Boston is a great example, because if you look at the Port of Boston and, and, and look, they've got a lot more growth uh, coming by the way of you know, what they've done in their planning um, at Conley Terminal. And also, you know, they've really done well on the cruise ships. All that requires dredging. But what I've learned when you, when, when you dredge and what you look at is the composition and material of the dredging. For instance, in Boston Harbor and around Boston Harbor, it's that real thick gray clay mud. I mean, it is thick. It's not sand. It's not silt like you see down on the, um, the mid-Atlantic. So it's a heavier material. And actually, they were able to use that material out of Boston Harbor and cap some of the, some of the areas that were, were polluted. So you take good clay, good material, put it on top of a place that may have been polluted, um, you know, all by Nut Island or something like that, the sewage treatment plant areas were from years past. And then you have that environmental capping um, of the of the material, so that's something. And look, you've had some great footage that you've showed uh, in here. You've got Corpus Christi, which is huge uh, by way of dredging um, coming along. Um, I think I believe that's Cashman right there uh, in Boston Harbor. But you know the the, the materials that you use, um, you like for instance, you wouldn't take the clay and necessarily rebuild an island uh, in the Mid Atlantic. It's just not the right material. But you could cap like in Boston Harbor. And then you can take the silt material from the Chesapeake Bay and rebuild an island in the Chesapeake Bay and so on and so forth, just like they did with the Kill Van Cull. So the Kill Van Cull, you know, that's, that's that um, uh, waterway between Staten Island and Bayonne. So you had a, a, a convergence of, of dredging and marine construction that went on there. You had to raise the Bayonne Bridge 64 feet to get where it is now. And then you had to dredge the Kill Van Cull uh, to 50 feet they had all the sand and silt out, and then there was some rock. And all of that material was used in and around New Jersey, some of those, some of those sites that were polluted decades ago. So that's, that's, that's what you see uh, with that dredging. I, you know, I thought I, saw, I thought I saw something explode. I saw like a big explosion in the water. I don't think you guys yeah. are blast fishing over there. What kind, of, uh, what kind yeah. of material are you using to blow things up? So that, I, I believe the one that you showed, that was a Great Lakes Dredge and Drop project in um, – Marcus Hook, so going into Philadelphia. Um, so they hit ledge, and you know sometimes you don't know it until you dig deep. So those channels were all 35, 40 feet since history, all right? So that's what they were always dredged to. And then once you needed the larger ships, you were going down more, you'd hit that ledge. And it, you know, it's a, I don't know what it's called. I mean, the short-term name is dynamite. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what you do is you, I mean, you put the um, you know explosive material in, you blast it, and then you go in what's called clamshells. So that's a clamshell on right now. And you'll pick that rock out, and then you'll reuse that rock maybe as riprap somewhere uh, on a coastal uh, shore. So that's what you see there, too, this marine construction. Yeah. The logistics and planning of this must be insane because you, you have to involve engineers, first of all. You have to have blast techs. You have to have divers. You have to have uh, yes. ship captains. You have to have crane operators. What is some of the equipment that we're looking at here that's being used? So you see, the, you know, the, the type of dredge that you see with the bucket, all right? So that's the bucket. That's a clamshell dredge, okay? So that's, that's a crane. Um, that's a bucket dredge. Then you have what's known as your cut-ahead suction dredge. And you had one of those when you were looking at the um, – um, when you were looking at um, Corpus Christi. Yeah, this Corpus Christi. And that's a big tooth suction. And it goes off the stern of the vessel and it goes back and forth across the, the, um, the waterway, the, the ocean floor, and it scoops up and puts it in a pipeline. So there's a pipeline that's hooked, and then you'll have, it's called the, otherwise known as a pipeline dredge, and you'll spit that material in, either into a barge, or if you're down in the Mississippi, you spit it right up on the dike and reuse it. And then, of course, you have the hopper dredges, 
And the hopper dredges are the traditional ones where they have arms that come off the side of the ship. And then they, they're like a vacuum cleaner and all of the material um, goes into the hopper. You see the hopper right there uh, with that gentleman speaking behind him. The centerboard of the ship is open. So the mud and the silt is, is vacuum cleaned into the hopper, like the term, hey, it's in the hopper. Yeah, the dredge material is in the hopper. All the mud and silt comes to the top. The water spills off over the side. And then you take that material and either place it uh, somewhere for beneficial use of dredge material, or you can put it out in the ocean. You know, so when I was uh, down over the weekend in Jackson Hole, our rafting, the guy who drove us down, who drove our raft down, he was this 18-year trucking veteran named Dan. He used to bring steel down from Maine down to the Big Dig. Big Dig was a, a big yes. problem. Would, would that be considered dredging? You have to dredge to build that. Yeah. And that was, uh, it was dangerous. We lost some absolutely. divers doing that. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if you, if you go back to the Big Dig, that was one of your original beneficial use projects. Because remember, the South Beach Expressway used to be above ground. Yeah. All right, you dug the tunnel, and all of that area right there, where, where you come from, um, you know, before you used to go into the Ted Williams Tunnel, which is which is part of the Big Dig, um, or before you go into the tunnel under under Chinatown in Boston, all those expressways are gone, and the material is put on top, and you have beautiful uh, walking paths, and you have um, trees and vegetation. That was all dredge material. And then you have the islands that were rebuilt in Boston Harbor as well. And, you know, you did have a good, you know, um, the largest hopper dredge, it's, it's a uh, 15,000 plus cubic yard hopper dredge. You, should, you had some photos of that, of the, um, the build. That's Manson Construction. And they're building one of their um, um, new dredges right now. And that's being done down in Brownsville, Texas. So the Rose Kennedy Greenway is, is dredging, that's made of dredging material? Some of it is, yes. Yes, some of it is. Yeah. Yeah, you had a lot of it. I mean, a lot of it was, I mean, it was taken out. They, they used a lot of that material. And that was Cashman. That was Jay Cashman from Quincy. So he's, he, he's a Quincy guy. And uh, he built his company. He started on the big dig, not necessarily dredging, but he was in construction. And then he had dredges. And, you know, there's a guy that started with a barge. And he's, and he's one of the, you know, he's, he's a huge dredging company now. What, hey, what projects are you working on now? What's, what's like the big thing in dredging going on? There's a bunch. I mean, we got them going on all the time. So you got, they're in New York. All right. So we have New York. Um, we have, we're always doing the Chesapeake Bay. Um, Houston, the Houston Ship Channel project has kicked off. Galveston. Um, I think what you'll see, you know, in the future, especially by way of container traffic and container coming into the United States, um, Houston's going to be huge. You know, Houston may grow five, six, seven fold in container traffic once they get the dredging completed. And you'll also see, you know, the sleeper that a lot of people uh, may not have heard of is Mobile, Alabama. There's gonna be a ton of dredging that will go on, go on down to Mobile, Alabama in order to set that up. Because that diversification of where, if you're a shipper, if you're a retailer, or you're somebody that imports to the United States, you want as many accessible ports in the United States as possible. And that's only gonna be done as long as you have the dredging available and in sync in order to get those ships in. And it's, and it's a big piece of the supply chain. Yeah, and look, if you're uh, you're like, hey, why should I care about this? Well, if you're a dredge driver, you're a shipper, uh, we can again just look at the example of the Port of Boston on, on sort of a micro scale. They had like one call going into that port until they fixed the dredging. Now they have like six or seven calls a week of ships yes. coming in. It brings in more commerce. It gives shippers more options. It gives drivers more loads to pull. It fills more warehouses. It's very, yes. very important to commerce and flow in America. This is so cool. Now... Yeah. I saw you put a post on LinkedIn, and I can't help but yeah. notice the date. It's 9-11. So I got to ask yes. you, Billy, where were you on 9-11? 9-11, I was actually, see, this is my um, Twin Towers from 9-11. I got that right after 9-11. I, I was not in New York. I was actually finishing a refrigeration course at my union school. I had just graduated from law school. I was waiting for my bar results, but I was still shipping out on ships. So I was leaving my refrigeration class and I was heading back up um, to New York from Maryland and I stopped in York, Pennsylvania. And that's when I, that's when I saw everything. But, you know, when you look at that day, okay, there, there, there is a, there is a, you know, number out there. So 500,000 
people were evacuated from lower Manhattan by vessel. These are Jones Act ferries, tugboats, dredges. You'll see that clip that I put up. There's a dredge that is full of people on board taking them from lower Manhattan because everything was closed down into New Jersey. It was done in nine hours. It's the largest boat lift ever in the world. The one that comes close to it was Dunkirk during World War II. That was 300,000 people over 10 days. It's an amazing movie too. Yeah. I, well, I, look, everything everything is supply chain. Even dredging ties into the darkest day in American history. But dredging does a lot of good. And people who want to learn more about it or they want to work with your association or they just want to talk to you about the benefits to maybe their port or they're a shipper, how do I send them your way? Yeah, we have a website. It's the uh, uh, you know, dredgingcontractorsofamerica.org. Um, um, and all of our contact information is there. We've got some good contact um, content, videos, uh, news, news clips. And, uh, you know, I'm out and about, so uh, I'm easy to get in touch with. And you can send them my way, Tim, if, uh, if they're looking for something. And, uh, hey, it's always a pleasure being on your show. And uh, like I said uh, last night, you can actually say this ain't my first rodeo. I can be truthful about it. <laughs> I can say that. And hey, hey, sorry about Tom Brady Appreciation Day yesterday. Bill Belichick may have ruined it. I'm not really sure, but it didn't. It didn't really work out. But he did get to ring the lighthouse, and it was good to see him back in town. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. All right. Keep in touch. All you right. will do. Take take care. I gotta get on one of them dredging ships one time. I'll see about that. I'll put you on there. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to go, Jack, from Jackson Hole to dredging ship. It's my next move. <laughs> Thank you, man. Take it easy. All right, everybody. Something new on the streets of Georgia to look out for. Meanwhile, take a look at this bad boy. That looks like a really nice semi-truck, but guess what? Take a closer look. Look at that license plate. Look at those flashing lights. That's a copper semi-truck. That's a cop semi-truck. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the Georgia police intend to do with this thing. Like, you're not going to, like, catch speeders or something. So I assume they're looking for people, like, on cell phones, maybe? Or, like, hands-free dialing? Seems a little extreme for that. Maybe it's to pick up, like trailers like contraband trailers i'm not exactly sure uh, a lot of police departments have been you know increasing their budgets to buy themselves some big equipment and these guys got this bad boy uh people online this thing took off like wildfire i think there's like 14 or 15 million views on this thing people are people have a lot of different takes on this cracker J box jimmy says hope it's speed restricted can't catch me flatfoot santino trucking goomba says i literally would not pull over for that mashed potatoes too says sweet are they looking for drivers he wants to be a cop trucker hank Wade says they probably have the cop's theme song and repeat on the cab. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? Uh, Massey Griffin Dragon says, if it's in Atlanta, I ain't worried. There's a lot going on in Atlanta. I don't know if you've driven through there. Jem says, it's, I'm not the crispest pair of Air Forces on the show rack, so I need help understanding why they need this. Pat says, they don't. I grew up in a very small rural town, and the police bought some sort of armored vehicle that resembles a tank. And Buck says, Optimus Prime is not catching me. LOL. All right, we got to find out about a new ruling. Drivers out there, carriers out there, this is kind of a big one. There's a new form of drug testing. Kathy Close, Transportation Safety Editor at J.J. Keller is with us now. Kathy, thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I, do you think that, that cop truck might, might be out there looking for us? Who knows? That was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That, so I kind of... I kind of... Cover work. Undercover work. Well, getting drug tests is not undercover. It's as, it's, it can be as transparent as, as possible, and there's a new way to go about it. Um, the final rule for saliva-based DOT drug testing, it went into effect actually months ago. It went into effect at the start of the summer, June 1st, but employers for some reason couldn't use this method, and I'd like to know why. Yeah, good question. Well, it comes down to the labs and testing kits. DOT procedures require what they call a split specimen, which is used to retest the specimen when the driver challenges a failed drug test result. All lab, labs have to be DOT certified. Uh, oh. Services? We losing, Kathy? Can we bring her back? I think they're going to bring you back on audio. Kathy, bear with us for just a second here as we learn more about this important issue. Guys, please advise in the back. What's up? Should we move on to the next one? Why don't we move on to elsewhere for a second? Will you fix that one up? This is how you get to, this is how you get on a boat if you're a ship captain. This is how you get on that drayage ship if you miss the ferry. You gotta ride over like this. How did you get to your office? 
I know a couple of drivers I'm going to be talking to. I know how they got in. They just walked right up the steps of their truck. They grabbed the handle because they're smart and they don't want to break their hip. And they got themselves in the seat of their cup. Kathy probably drove in. I drove. Actually, my wife drove in because we had to take uh, Graham out of the airport because she was watching the kids while we were in Jackson. Not a lot of room for error here. If you fall between that and the boat, you're probably going to get crushed. John Conrad, he's a captain. He said he's been telling Rachel Premack we need to get her on a ship to Manhattan like this. Vijar Cole says, I imagine Molson Hart does this when his product shipments are delayed. Rona Research says, when I was your age, I had to go to work fighting, this, fighting the sea uphill both ways. Um, I asked if we could do this on the Tennessee River at F3, and uh, John Conrad said you can't because it'd be hard to get a container ship in there. But, of course, Losses Reed said we could just airlift them. All right, we have you back. Let's, let's go back to that question because it kind of cut off. Why can't carriers use this uh, saliva testing yet? by Health and Human Services in order to process the uh, saliva. And at this point, there's no labs that are on the list certified. It takes several months for a lab to become certified. And our understanding is that it will be at earliest late 2023 or early 2024. We're almost done with the year. I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking early 2024. So what do we do during, like, what do the carriers do during the delay? They just stick to the, with the method they've been using? Well, they can't actually, they can't start the saliva testing, obviously, until there's labs to process it. Um, but in the meantime, they need to look at um, how, if they want to use the testing method, you know, um, are they going to use it? And if so, when? They can use it for post-accidents, reasonable suspicion, return to duty. What, what testing methods are they um, testing, reasons for testing, are they going to use the method for? They have to make some business decisions. They also have to look at whether they're going to, you know, update their policy to show as, as an alternate testing method, for example, will they switch to saliva testing when there's a shy bladder um, or in, you know, insufficient specimen? Like if they're going to use the saliva test, will they switch back to urine testing because the driver has a dry mouth? They have to look at all of the scenarios and, and when and if they're going to use that testing method. So yeah, update their policy to reflect this. They're going to have to communicate what they're going to do um, to everybody who's involved with DOT testing. Train your drivers on it. You know, um, one big change on is during the um, testing process, this collector is going to do an oral, oral cavity search. You're looking, looking at your driver's mouth to see if they brought something in to tamper or, Ooh. you know, uh, mess with the saliva specimen. So your drivers need to be aware of that. And then train your support staff. Especially the DER, you know, when they're the frontline person getting the calls from the clinics, they need to know what to what to do, what's required, what your carrier prefers. Um, speak with your collection site, you know, as to what what you want to be done in regard to saliva testing. Um, that also brings up a point, you know, check your contracts with your um, service providers, your CTPA. You know, make sure that um, they, they line up your clinics and your MROs. Um, you know, make sure they find um, facilities that can accommodate what your choices are. The collection sites, you know, will they offer the uh, saliva um, drug testing? And if so, are they going to have their staff trained on this and up and running? Are they going to do the testing uh, kit that your lab prefers? There might be more than one testing kit and each one has to be certified based on what their ability is to process. So it's lining up all your service providers, your MRO, are they ready to handle that kind of uh, test result. Again, your labs um, are when they're ready to roll. Will they offer saliva-based drug testing? And will they be using the testing kit that your collection site is using? You know, ideally, um, you, you need to make sure you have standing orders in place with the clinics, the collection sites, so they know what you want done. Um, Kathy, let me ask you're not you using let me ask sure, you something. Why, why saliva over urine? They've been using urine for a long time. Why would you, why yeah. would you switch to, survivor, uh, to saliva? Well, yeah, the detection windows. Um, you know, so the same drugs are tested for, but yeah. it gives you more recent use. So it's more advantageous for post-accident tests, and reasonable suspicion testing. Maybe you want to check for chronic um, use. So maybe the urine specimen would be more um, acceptable for pre-employment or random tests. So, you know, you want to um, maybe use a combination of the two, a hybrid model. So, um, and cheating too, it's, it's actually, it's all observed. So there's nothing that the driver should be able to do to, to um, tamper with the specimen. And privacy, those um, 
uh, direct observations because again, it's just swabbing, doing the mouth and getting a collection. Um, that whole um, privacy intrusion, um, drivers might, might be less likely to be um, uh, apprehensive about testing if, if you use a, an a oral fluid method. Interesting. And costs, we're not quite sure whether it's cheaper or whether it's um, more expensive. That the We're not quite sure on that. There's been different reports on that. But you'll have to talk with your service providers to see what they're able to offer you. So that's something also to line up in advance of the, um, when you're able to take advantage of this testing method. Now, if you're going to use this method, are you required to provide existing drivers with the new policy? Not existing drivers, technically, no. Um, it's a good best practice to update your policy. Maybe you know, do an addendum to those existing drivers so rather than give them the whole 20 pages document that you might have and um, just give them the pieces that are relevant, especially when they go to the, the, the clinic, um, they know what will um, be expected of them, especially at oral cavity search and there's a 10 minute wait and whatnot. They need to know what's expected of them. You don't want an inadvertent refusal to test because they weren't told. Yeah. Wow. Well, so big changes coming up. They could finally start next year. Where do people go to get more information in the meantime? Sure. Um, we are monitoring this whole situation. Go to jjkeller.com. And uh, we have uh, news items out there. We have a drug and alcohol topic page, which we have information on. And we have a contact us if you want to, you know, have questions. And they'll route it to somebody such as myself, a subject matter expert, if you have regulatory questions. Just go to jjkeller.com. There's a bunch of resources there. Very cool. Hey, thank you for coming on the show on a Monday and, and letting us know what was up. I appreciate your time today, Kathy. Thank you. All right. Bye. Take it easy. No ride, no app, no problem. With Uber Central on Uber for Business, you can help your drivers get where they need to go after dropping off the truck. Schedule rides, control costs, and access 24-7 support in an easy-to-use dashboard. Go to uberforbusiness.com to learn more. And like I mentioned, your driver's out there, one parking spot every 11 drivers. They're parked. You can dispatch them out on an Uber. You can make them feel good. doesn't cost a lot of money and helps in retention. We have a big problem with that in our industry. But you know who's trying to solve it? and who may be doing an awesome job? Our next two guests. I love this story for National Truck Driver Appreciation Week, and I love both their stories because I've read some articles on them. It's Ricky Sharp and Ashley Millisec. They're associate to driver. They're with the Associate to Driver program at Walmart and Sam's Club. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, can we unmute them? You guys unmuted? Yes, I'm unmuted. Thank I you see, for having yeah, you, us today. I'm happy to have you. We got Ashley, you up now? You got your volume? No, we don't have Ashley. Guys in the back, help Ashley out and let me know what's going on. But in the meantime, I'll talk to Ricky. Ricky, how you doing today? I'm excellent, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. I, I, I love this, this story, you know, because there's always all this talk about a truck driver shortage and truck driver retention and all of this stuff. And Walmart is out here. Like, Walmart is already considered to be, like, the Harvard of trucking, especially of company driving. It's a very aspirational gig for a lot of drivers. But now you don't just have to be a driver to aspire for that. You could be on the counter. You could be like Ashley, who had, like, five or six jobs within Walmart and have your pathway to the back of the wheel. Tell me a little bit about this. Absolutely. It's a very new program that uh, we had a concept about a year and a half ago. We currently have seven locations that are supporting an associate to drive a program at Walmart. And I am blessed and honored to work with the team in Dallas, Texas to lead that site uh, there in Dallas. But it's given our associates an opportunity to, to start a new career to better their lives to just make a difference and something they've always wanted to do uh, how so it is truly an honor just to be a part of that now when did this program start and how did you get involved with it well i i've been a driver for walmart for, for 20 years and recently accepted this role as the regional training center site manager in dallas for fleet development training associate to drivers and onboarding drivers so um, I've always been around the trucking industry. I've been in the industry over 35 years. I uh, was a part of Walmart Road Team, which represented the, uh, the private fleet throughout uh, truck driving championships, as well as onboarding our drivers, training, 
a number of drivers across the country. So um, I, I think this is probably a good fit for me because I've been around the industry just so long and I, I have a passion for giving back and, and helping build the safest drivers on America's highway and uh, just an awesome opportunity. I love it, and I can hear it in your voice, too. Let's hear from one of the first graduates of the program. Ashley, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? We are, we're, we're doing awesome. I was, I was reading an article about you, and I got really impressed by that. You were doing a whole bunch within Walmart before you got into this program. Tell us a little bit about your journey to the Associate to Driver program. Uh, yes, sir. So um, I started in 2014 with Walmart. I started as an overnight stalker in a store called uh, Anadarko, Oklahoma. Um, we were closed at night, and uh, I mean, it was a great experience. After that, I was there for maybe a year, and then I went to uh, Gainesville, Texas, and I was a front-end assistant. From there, I went to online grocery assistant, uh, general merchandise assistant, um, and then I went back to OGP for a little bit, which is online grocery pickup. And then after that, I went to overnights as a coach. So it was a phenomenal experience. I've had um, plenty of uh, time to you know, create those phenomenal relationships with my associates. Um, and along the way, I've made awesome friends. So what happened? You were like, you're, you're back at the docks over there. You're, you're starting to see the drivers come and go. You get a little envious. You're like, hey, what would life be like behind the wheel? How did you end up in the program? How does that work? So basically, uh, I started as an associate. So whenever I did pretty much like a whole 360, but I was wearing different shoes and I was a salary member of management, um, I pretty much have almost done everything in this store. Uh, I love challenges and that's uh, what I was looking for. Uh, and then that's what I saw. I mean, the truckers coming in, the drivers, I mean, they just, they were glowing. They were so excited. And, you know, I just felt like that was a challenge that I wanted to take on. Now, Ricky, you get to be like the proud papa here when you're you're training these these. So, are you do you like walk around Walmart on the daily and and you're looking at? Are you like recruiting people? You're like you're doing a great job putting those boxes on the shelves. Have you ever thought about driving the truck? Well, uh, don't necessarily walk around the stores doing that, but I, I always like to promote the program and the opportunity that it gives our associates to make a difference in their lives and to make a difference uh, within the company. It's giving back. Um, to the motor and public as well, serving our customers. I think that is it's truly the base of who we are as a company is making that difference is what we've always known, uh, been known for and what we do today. And Ashley is a prime example of uh, that opportunity who did an extremely awesome job of going uh, through the 12 week program at Walmart and just excelled in every area of, of uh, uh, why she was in the program. and. Uh, doing just an awesome job out there on the road now and becoming a private free professional driver. So it's an amazing opportunity. And just to watch someone like Ashley who have that desire to be different, to make a difference and to want that extra opportunity and for Walmart to give uh, our associates that opportunity uh, to do that is amazing to me. So you get the zero trucking experience associate handed to you to train. What does that first few weeks of the program look like? How do you get them into trucking shape? Well, that first few weeks, we basically uh, spend time getting to know them as well as going through the what we call our just entry level training of understanding uh, to how to get the CLP. Then once they get the uh, learners, commercial learners permit, then we go into what we call our JJK learning so they understand more about what the trucking background industry is the uh, regulations the guidelines and all of that and then once we get through that then we start what we call our range and road um, training where they spend a lot of time on the yard at backing uh, pre-trip and preparing themselves to take their CDL test and once they receive the CDL then we, we get into the what we call the nuts and bolts of our training of building the professional driver, mm. the safest driver on the highway, understanding that every decision you make makes a difference, being prepared, being ready, understanding the industry, understanding the expectation of our drivers and the professionalism that we set and the example that we have here of, of a high standard of high expectation and we just build our drivers day by day, 
uh, brick by brick, block by block. Yeah, your, your logo's on the side of that truck, right? You're getting paid well. Drive with some respect. Drive with some honor. Drive with some pride. Now, actually, let, let me ask you, what's the program been like? What was the hardest part to learn? Was it was it backing into docs? Um, it was it was understanding backing, but honestly, what really whooped my butt was the blind side parallel. Ooh. That was a struggle. <laughs> um, but like any challenges, there's always frustrations. So, you know, they really talked about learning how to just kind of step away, come back to it, readjust. And uh, what's phenomenal about it, though, is that they will trade out facility trainers with us. Um, that way they just have different tactics, different communication styles. And, you know, finally I got one that, you know, it just kind of clicked and it all fell together for me. Now, trucking is, is a great field, but it's not for everybody. So let me ask you from your just personal experience, Ashley, what do you, what do you think – make someone successful within the program what, what should your goals be um a mindset uh be confident uh, i'm telling you the impact and the magnitude of sitting behind that wheel and understanding how big that responsibility is um you have to understand like you have to own it um it is all about safety um but also you got to come in and you got to be vulnerable you got to put your guard down and you have to be willing to learn um, you know, I, it made it a little bit easier because, you know, I started from ground zero and um, that kind of really helped me out. You know, Ricky, I love this quote from um, Chris Nicholas, the COO of Walmart USA. He said, most graduations have something in common. They inspire hope for new opportunity. And that's a big statement, but it's a real one, too. It means that you could be um, an associate over there. You could be at the register. You could be stocking. And you can realize there's pathways. There's pathways to growth. So many types of retail jobs, are, they're labeled as being like dead end or something. And Walmart has given people this great opportunity. What do you look for? And how does it make you proud that you're inspiring that hope? Absolutely. Um, that what inspires me the most about the program is giving someone an opportunity that they never had before, but now you got an opportunity to be the best professional driver in the industry, to be able to, to know that I am on that road out there. As Ashley just spoke about taking ownership of it, setting that standard, having the value of safety, realizing that Hey, I'm responsible for what I do. I'm responsible for the highway. I'm responsible for my equipment. I'm responsible for myself, but I'm also responsible to make a difference in, in the lives of others, giving back uh, that knowledge, that information uh, to help our drivers be better. Uh, this week, we celebrate uh, Walmart National Driver Appreciation Week. Uh, giving back to our drivers, letting our drivers know, hey, we are so thankful for the job that you do every day. We appreciate you. We know that you're away from home a lot. We know that uh, you're out there on the highway on some long days. But, hey, this week we want to celebrate our drivers and say thank you for a job well done. You are truly the best of the best in the industry. I'll give a little cowbell to all the drivers out there for that one. Actually, let's take this a step deeper, though. There, we're in an industry that, unfortunately, there's only about, over, I don't know, at Walmart, but overall, only about 7% of drivers are females. Here you are in a great Walmart program. You went through this associate program, and you're a female driver. That has to feel pretty good. Do you feel like you're inspiring other women to follow in your footsteps? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then the more that comes to light with the program and then just uh, more females getting into the industry. I mean, I have so many people asking me questions, um, other women um, in particular. And, uh, you know, I really, truly do sit there and have a conversation with them, inspire them, um, you know, and I'm telling them the same thing I'm telling you guys, you know, just have the ownership, be confident, be willing to learn. And I'm telling you, I love it only because, like, you could tell the drive that they have in their eyes. And I love to see that around me. Wow. Yeah, no, it sounds like it sounds like people who come through the program love it. Now, you mentioned, Ricky, you mentioned uh, National Truck Driver Appreciation Week. Uh, what should we all be thinking about? What should our listeners be thinking about during this week and in terms of trucking and drivers? Is take the time this week to just say thank you. Thank you to our drivers for delivering uh, America's freight. Thank you for the long days, just saying, hey, we appreciate you. And we spent our entire week this week at Walmart telling every one of our drivers thank you, but also thank you to the team that helps make our drivers better. Uh, for my, for instance, my facilitators who train uh, drivers like Ashley to be professional.
joining us. Just want to say we appreciate you and give a little something back and let you know is that your hard work is not going unnoticed. And just thank you for the job you do every day. Well, thank you, Ricky, and thank you, Ashley, for the job that you do every day. Now, before I let you go and we find out where, uh, where people can learn more about the program, Ashley, what, what advice would you like to leave people with who are considering perhaps taking this path? I would say take the leap. Um, a lot of people are kind of, you know, unsure of the unknown, but really you really don't know what's behind that door unless you open it, right? Um, it's about being confident about making that next step. I mean, and if you truly believe that, you know, this is the path for you, everything will fall in place. Um, you know, everything else about the safety and stuff, it's really there. It's the everything's genuine about the program. Um, and I back it 100 percent. So if it's definitely something that you're thinking about, do it. Love to hear it. Now, Ricky, you've inspired me. How do, how do we go to become an How do we get into the program? Well, uh, for an associate, you just you will. Uh, apply through the associate portal or having that opportunity. And if you are someone who do not work for us and you want to become a driver for Walmart, you can check us out on uh, www.drive4walmart.com and um, apply there with us. And uh, what I, I also want to say is that, you know, there's a lot of trucks on the road out there that, every day. But what we like to look at ourselves here at Walmart is when you sit behind the wheel, of that truck, then it means something. You you set the standards. You bring the value. You exemplify and represent the best driver in the industry. Take pride in that, value that, and know that you are truly appreciated from Walmart as well as from our customers. And I just want to say to all of our drivers out there today who may be listening, thank you for the job you do every day. Stay safe, courtesy, and be pride. Have pride in what you're doing. Yeah, I can give you a little cowbell for that. Thank you, drivers. Thank you, too. Thank you so much for telling us about this wonderful program. I love to hear it. And, uh, you know, Walmart, there's a reason they're considered best in class, and I think that these two did a great job of telling you why. Have a great Monday, and uh, keep growing that program. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you. Take it easy. Wow, great stuff. Those two, were, those two were awesome. Everyone I know who drives for Walmart, uh, they've all said that they love it, so what they were saying didn't surprise me, but what a cool pathway. What a cool pathway. You could be working at Walmart and now suddenly you're driving a truck. I love it. I love Ashley's story. All right. So you guys may have heard. I was I was away last week, you know, after Wednesday. So so much stuff happened. One of it was like the big fallout over at Flexport, but I was still working. I was going to my sources and everything. And I got some leaked footage of the board meeting between Ryan. Good stuff. Well, maybe not good stuff. I don't know. There's a lot of fault, a lot of drama, and a lot of people got wrapped up into this. But let's see what happened first, because a lot of people have been speculating. Ryan Peterson has been very transparent during this on X. I don't know if you follow him on there. If you do, his account is types fast, and he made a lot of this issue public. And his statement on why they had to make this change is pretty simple. I've been in the job for 18 hours now. That's his first statement. He was replying to someone else who asked why X and X happened. And he said, that said, it's obvious why this happened. The previous leadership wasn't trying to make the company profitable. And it could just be that Amazon philosophy just did not mesh with what Flexport's doing. Flexport at heart, NVOCC, moving boxes around the globe, putting tech layers over it, doing customs brokerage, that kind of thing. Uh, Dave Clark gets deeper into fulfillment and wants to get that secondary area of relationship, but those are often not the same thing. And maybe it just wasn't working out for the two. Ryan Peterson had this to say afterwards, though, because he takes over. He's looking at the books. He says that, you know, we got to get our finances back in order. We're not to profitability where we need to be, right? So apparently a bunch of offers were put out. And this was unfortunate. This, this was a very controversial statement. I'll read the whole thing. It says, Flexport is rescinding a bunch of signed offer letters for people who are starting as soon as this Monday. I'm deeply sorry to those who were expecting to join our company won't be able to at this time. It's messed up, but no way around it. We have had a hiring freeze for months. I have no idea why more than seven and five people were were signed to join or why we had over 200 open roles on our website. All of those have been canceled except for a handful of roles directly tied to our most important initiatives, improving timelines of our freight services. A Flexport team member will reach out to each of you personally as soon as possible to explain the move. This went on social. People were, were roasting 
uh, Ryan. They're saying, how can you do this? People probably turned down other offers. They didn't get jobs. And um, Ryan took some action to help some of the people who were left out. This is what he had to say afterwards. He said, we've created what I think is a pretty generous stipend for candidates who've accepted offers we've rescinded. And we're pivoting our entire recruiting org to help those awesome people land on their feet with great companies. If your company is hiring tech or logistics talent and wants to connect with pre-vetted people who cleared Flexport's very high bar, DM me and I'll get you into the process that we've created to match these great folks with companies that are hiring. I, you know, some people are like, oh, this is the worst thing ever. I got to applaud this. You know what? He's being transparent. He made it public. He got called out a little bit, and they're they're doing the work to help land some people. And because he made this public, more companies are aware of these pre-vetted candidates who can get jobs now. So I would say the end result, sorry for those, you know, sorry for those workers that always sucks to lose a job. I've been fired a few times myself. Never fun. But at least some methods are being taken here. We'll have to see what goes on with Flexport. Big change. I hope to get Ryan Peterson on here soon to learn more about this, what Flexport is now, what Flexport's going to be, and how they reach those, those goals that they think that they can set. I think that we're all really curious, and we'd all like to know more about what is Flexport right now in fall of 2023, and where does Ryan plan on taking it? I know I sure do. Let's look at something really cool. You talk about truck driver appreciation. Let's, let's appreciate the people who help truck drivers out, too. This is a rescue right here. Roll this tape. This happened in Salisbury, North Carolina. The police department released the video of one of their officers rescuing a non-responsive truck driver from a burning truck on I-85. This happened um, in, on Tuesday, August 8th. The video just came out a few days ago. This is Lieutenant Corey Brooks. He was responding to after hours to a separate incident shortly before 9 p.m. when he observed that the truck hit a retaining wall and was catching fire. Without hesitation, Brooks stepped and ran to the truck's cab, as you can see here, where he found the driver, Michael Williams, unconscious. He immediately called the incident in over his police radio, but did not wait for assistance before springing into action. Brooks pulled the driver out of the truck seat and over the passenger seat to free him from that burning truck. An unidentified female driver assisted Brooks in pulling this trucker to safety on the opposite, opposite side of the road across two travel lanes. As fire and EMS arrived at the scene, the driver started to gain consciousness. They saved this guy's life. Look at that fire, too. Amazing work. Little cowbell for that unidentified driver and Mr. Lieutenant Corey Brooks. Awesome job. Now, you guys know I'm a Lego nerd. How cool is this? I love the rumble. Sadly, they don't make a lot of Lego truck sets, so this guy had to make his own. That's why you see I like the mist colors. They made like a nice form box set. That'd be fantastic. Lego, get on it, man. We need a semi-truck. It's Truck Driver Appreciation Week, or else we'll have to go buy our own, because I showed you the semi-truck pontoon boats before, but know what's the new thing? Know what's the new hotness? How about a semi-truck golf cart? Look at this. Hey, guys. There's a guy in Kingman, Arizona that makes semi-truck golf carts. Little mini semi truck, but it's built on a golf cart. Simple as that. It comes with air horn, air suspension, smoke stacks. It's got a 420 cc engine in it. That's a pretty good size motor for a little golf cart. These things are actually pretty big. Comes with a trailer too, I guess. Um, there's a phone number. I'm pretty sure you guys can call if you guys are interested. He does ship out of state. I'm pretty sure. So if you guys are interested in one of these, go give him a call or look for this ad. Really cool. A little expensive, though. $15,000 uh, over in my neighborhood. It's very golf cart friendly, and I've been pricing them out, and it's like, I don't know, $4,500 for a used one? Maybe. How about this? You think these guys are going to revolutionize the furniture industry? Furniture moving? Got a couple of, what are those, bird scooters? They've got a couch. They've got each other. Let's see it move. Mac Lovin says, I'm more impressed with the synchronized scooting. Sean Roberts, the broker, probably had good margins on that one. I bet. All right, let's drop that because we got one left here. We'll let this one play us out like keyboard cat. You ever get in a little road rage, but you have to, you know, calm yourself down? How about a little music? You can find me on Twitter. Timothy Dooner, that's D double O N E R. You can find what the truck at freeways, no F W. What the truck, you can find this show on uh, YouTube. <laughs> you can find this show on YouTube. You can find us on every podcast player everywhere. Hey, I'm good to be back. I'll see you on Wednesday. Take care, don't be a stranger. <laughs>